Good morning to all our viewers and a warm welcome to the Financial Intelligence Center's uh, webinar. For today's webinar, we are going to be focusing on uh, the money laundering and terrorist financing risks as it pertains to beneficial ownership. So we'll be looking at um, uh, customer due diligence, at additional due diligence, and um, that that we should apply to legal persons as such. Also, where you find that prominent influential persons are part of a legal entity, or, or how do you deal with sanctioned in, uh, persons that are uh, beneficial owners to a legal entity? So again, a warm welcome to all the viewers out there, wherever you are streaming from, we welcome you. Welcome to this webinar on beneficial ownership. Just a part of the housekeeping rules, please, you will find a register on the right hand side of your uh, screen. There is a link. Click on it. The register will come up. Please complete all the registration details. What we do do is we send out a copy of the presentation to all the um, registered attendees. So uh, just from myself, I will be the MC for today's session. I'm Yolandi Plaiki. I'm a senior compliance officer here at the Financial Intelligence Center. I'm joined by my colleague who will introduce himself also um, a bit further, uh, Mr. Philip van Langenhoven. And um, together we will provide you with some insights uh, on beneficial ownership. So thank you again for joining. Uh, we do have a part at the end that will be question and answer session. So please, please, please send through your questions as and when you have the question, type it into the question chat box. At the end of the session, we will uh, try to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much. So just in terms of if I can go through to the agenda, you'll see there we've got our welcome and opening statement. And then we'll go through a bit of uh, the customer due diligence, which includes additional due diligence requirements that is found um, in terms of the FIC Act. If you look at uh, Chapter 3 of the FIC Act, you'll see it there. Then after that, we'll also look at some money laundering and terrorist financing risks in relation to legal entities, prominent influential persons and sanctioned entities. And then we'll finally touch on and a brief overview, basically, of a reporting. And then we'll take uh, your whatever questions and answers you might have on uh, today's topics. So without further ado, let me just go further into the focus of today's session. So as we all know, when dealing with a legal person, uh, there's varieties of different legal persons. But always when dealing with those legal persons, there is somebody who ultimately benefits from that legal entity. And that person is called a beneficial owner. And um, oftentimes you'll find that uh, criminals know uh, that a legal entity can be used as or, or misused or abused as a, uh, as a front in order to launder their funds. So often you'd find that criminals would abuse these legal entity types. They create the legal entities or they find existing ones and they actually just use that legal entities just to move their money, their criminal proceeds um, in a manner that they evade uh, detection. So that's the importance of understanding who the beneficial owner is is to understand if there's any criminal entities or, or persons behind a legal company who's actually benefiting from that legal company. So they do this in various ways. They establish uh, banking accounts with banks. They'd move funds through their representative companies uh, through the use of various different types of accountable institutions. And we see this happening not only on a domestic scale, but also on, on an international uh, scale. So if you look internationally, there's various types of examples that shows you that actually criminals use shell companies, use front companies as a means of laundering the illicit funds. So it's very important for the accountable institution to understand exactly who they're dealing with 
when they deal with a legal person, understand the legal person itself, and then who owns that legal person, who benefits from that legal person ultimately. And that's the focus of uh, beneficial ownership and our fight against it from, from an anti-money laundering perspective. That being noted, uh, not all legal persons um, are used for illicit activity. However, you must be aware that there is certain instances, obviously, where they'll be abused. Okay, so just a bit more from an international point of view. Uh, so South Africa is a member of the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, that Financial Action Task Force is a, basically an intergovernmental body um, that sets standards on anti-money laundering and um, anti a combating of terrorist financing and combating of proliferation financing and so So the Financial Action Task Force, um, as part of these standards, they've got uh, the recommendations, the FATF recommendations, and those recommendations also cover beneficial ownership, which I'll cover in the next few slides. But what I would like to point out is a definition that the FATF follows when it considers beneficial ownership. And here they refer to beneficial owner is the natural person who ultimately owns or controls a customer and or the natural person on whose behalf a transaction is conducted. It also includes those persons who exercise ultimate effective control over a legal person. So you can see there's different elements to this definition. There's an element of ownership. You can either own a, a, um, a legal entity and control it through your ownership interest, or you can exercise effective control over a legal person through other manners. That is either you are a director or you some sort of nominee, director, or so forth. Then, uh, if you look at the definition that's basically set out by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, they state that the, the availability of beneficial ownership information, i.e., for example, the natural person behind a legal entity or arrangement is now a key requirement of international tax transparency and the fight against tax evasion and other financial crimes. Beneficial owners are always natural persons who ultimately own or control a legal entity or arrangement, such as a company, a trust, or a foundation. Okay, so in terms of when you consider ownership, there's different forms of ownership. So you'll find uh, what's referred to an, uh, a legal owner versus a beneficial owner. A legal owner is that person, that legal entity that actually owns uh, whatever else legal entity in paper. But that legal own owner is then owned by um, by other persons and and. A beneficial owner is the ultimate natural person that owns whatever legal persons. So if you look at this, you'll see that for a legal person of the first diagram on your left hand side, legal person B, legal person B own legal legal person B is basically owned by legal person C. However, legal person C is owned 100% by a natural person, and that natural person is then the beneficial owner. Even though there is a legal person who is a legal owner in between. So it's important not to stop at a legal owner. You must go down to a natural person when determining who is the beneficial owner. Then if you go to the FATF recommendations on um, beneficial ownership that deals with beneficial ownership, you'll see the uh, recommendation 24 is deals with transparency and beneficial ownership of legal persons. Basically, um, in summary, recommendation 24 states that countries should take measures to prevent the misuse of legal persons for money laundering 
or terrorist financing and ensure that there is adequate, accurate and timely information of beneficial of the beneficial owner and control of legal persons. So there must be information provided on who's beneficial owner and the control structure of a legal person. And then there also we are legal persons that are able to issue better shares or better share warrants or which allow nominee shareholders or nominee directors should take effective measures to ensure that they are not misused for money laundering or terrorist financing. And then FATF recommendation 25 uh, deals with transparency and beneficial ownership of legal arrangements. There it states that countries should take measures to prevent the misuse of legal arrangements for money laundering or terrorist financing and ensure that there is adequate, accurate and timely information on trusts basically. So that legal arrangements can be trusts and any other type of legal entity. If you look at uh, the FATF recommendations, besides FATF recommendation 24 and 25, also look at the interpretive note to this actual recommendation 24 and 25. The interpretive note basically sets out the fact that, um, or the requirement that you should know and understand the different forms of legal entities that um, you may deal with and also assess the risk of those different legal entity types. Obviously, different legal entity types pose different levels of risk, and you would then have to um, put in place uh, enhanced control measures where you're dealing with an entity of a higher risk or so forth. So that was just basically the introduction to beneficial ownership. Um, what I am going to do now is I am going to hand back to uh, hand over to my colleague uh, Philip Langenhoven, and I'll ask Philip just to uh, basically introduce himself, give give a bit more uh, background on himself, and then go further into his um, presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Yulandi. Um, good morning from my side to everybody, and uh, welcome to our webinar. I do trust that you will find it. Uh, you know that that you will get some information from it and that uh, you will find it helpful in your compliance um, activities. So my name is Philip Langenwerfen. I am with uh, FIC in the Compliance and Prevention Department and uh, I'm going to, to take you through a few slides specifically on customer due diligence. Um, so Yulandi explained um, the whole issue of, of FATF and uh, as she said in her presentation, South Africa is a member of the Financial Action Task Force and as a member we have to comply with their uh, rules and, and with their standards. Now um, it's not only about complying with the FATF standards, um, South Africa is also um, trying to, to attract uh, good uh, sustainable long-term investors and these people do look at, uh, at, at uh, you know, memberships of international organizations like the FATF and uh, to, to, to make sure that they don't invest in a place where, um, you know, money laundering is is on the order of the day. So um, it is important that uh, we comply with their um, with their requirements. So, um, so I'm going to explain to you how we have in our legislation included the FATF requirements um, that uh, customer due diligence must be done on uh, on legal entities and, um, and and that you have to take additional steps um, in addition to those that, that you would do for individual um, and natural persons uh, when, when it comes to, um, to corporate uh, entities. So first of all, in Section 20A of the Financial Intelligence Center Act, uh, we say that an accountable institution may not conduct business with an anonymous client or a client with an apparent false or fictitious name. So if your client say to you that he is uh, Joe Soap or Mickey Mouse or something like that, then it's an apparent or, or fictitious name. So you have to have um, information on, on, on your client. You have to know who you are dealing with. Um, you have to obtain that information and keep record of it. Um, obviously, as you know, there is record keeping requirements in the FIC Act. So uh, that is once you have obtained the information on the client, you have to keep that on the record for a period of five years. 
Um, the FIC Act also talks about single transaction, and it defines a single transaction as a transaction where an amount is more than 5,000 Rand. Um, that is opposed to a business relationship. They talk about a business relationship and a single transaction. Now, business relationship is, is a longer term relationship between the accountable institution and its client. A single transaction is concluded on a once off basis, and there's no expectation that that, that will occur again, that uh, you know you will see ever see the client again. You still have to identify and verify the information uh, on the client. Regulation 1A of the Money Laundering and Terror Financing Control Regulations um, explains the whole issue of um, a single transaction. And it basically say, as we said there in the slide, that um, it's a transaction of more than 5,000 Rand. Um, let me just say that it doesn't mean that if you do a once-off transaction um, of less than 5,000 Rand, you don't have to do anything. Um, we do say in our guidance note number seven that um, accountable institutions must at least get some information, just the basic information on the client if the if it is a single transaction uh, that is less than 5,000 Rand. So, um, accountants, in terms of the FIC Act, accountable institutions has to identify all its prospective clients. They have to identify all persons that are authorized to act on behalf of the clients. In other words, if there's a situation where it's not the client itself, but it's somebody acting on behalf of the client, you also have to identify and verify the identity of those people that are acting on behalf of the clients. In addition, um, we also have a requirement that um, in instances where a client is authorized to act on somebody else, that client, as well as the person that he or she is authorized to act on, needs to be identified and the identity needs to be verified. So th those requirements you'll find in Section 21.1a and Section 21.1c of the FIC Act. Um, as I've already said, you have to, uh, to verify all the, uh, the, the identities of your clients and that you would do uh, with specific, um, uh, you know, um, um, documents or information that you need to obtain, which will I, which, on which I will give more information as, as we go along. And all of that must be in line with your uh, risk management and compliance program. Now, that is a very important document. Um, all the requirements that needs, to be that needs to be included in the RMCP is obtained or is included in Section 42 of the FIC Act. So um, I would suggest that you have a good look at Section 42 and you draft your RMCP in accordance with the requirements of Section 42 of the FIC Act. Um, the Act also requires accountable institutions to understand and obtain information on a business relationship. As I said earlier, that is where there's a longer term uh, commitment and relationship between the accountable institution and the client. So in those instances, instances an accountable institution must um, uh, get information and must understand the nature of the business relationship. They must understand the intended purpose of a business relationship and the source of funds, where the money comes from. So typically, um, if I can give an example, if you're an estate agent and somebody wants to uh, uh, rent property from you, um, you need to to determine, uh, you know, whether that those property, whether it's a residential property, whether it's a flat, a house, whether it's a commercial property. Um, once you've determined that, you need to determine what is the purpose of of that business relationship. What is this institution going to to do? This this client going to do with this property? Um, if it's for commercial pro uh, um, purposes, what kind of business are they going to conduct in the in the in the property? Those are just examples. Obviously, it goes without saying the nature of the business and the purpose of the business relationship. And then, as I said, where the money comes from. Um, how are they going to pay for this transaction is very important. Uh, in, in instances of a, of a, um, a business relationship. Also, um, as I said earlier, the risk management and compliance program it needs to be written up there. Um, that is a very, that, that's your ultimate guideline for complying with the FIC Act. 
Okay, then the next slide um, is customer due diligence, and it's about identification and verification. So um, a client information is obtained during the take on stage or as part of the client engagement process. So when you start talking to the client, uh, one of the things that you need to do is to start uh, working on the inf obtaining the information on who this client is, what uh, is the nature of the business, what is the source of the income, um, and, and what is the, the intention of, of the transaction. You need to verify information that you obtain during the take on process um, or the client engagement process. And that means that you need uh, corroboration of the information by comparing it against the original source, electronic data issues, or reliable third parties. The information must be accurate and you do to take this step, the verification this step to make sure that the information is actually accurate and correct. Um, Accountable institutions, after the introduction of the risk-based approach, um, has flexibility to choose the type of information to establish the client's identity and the means to verify the information obtained. As you probably know, um, prior to 2017, uh, October 2017, we had what we called a, a rules-based approach, and there were very specific um, requirements in the money laundering uh, regulations, or uh, money laundering and terror financing control regulations, rather, uh, they had very specific, specific information on um, how, what information you need to obtain to, to, to uh, confirm or to verify the identity of clients. Um, since the introduction of the risk-based approach, there's a lot more flexibility on accountable institutions to choose, um, you know, types of information that will assist them to establish and to verify the, the, the client's identity. <coughs> The nature and extent of the verification is determined on the assessed risk and in terms of the risk management and compliance program. Uh, we, we don't want to go into too much detail on that today because that's not what the, what the um, um, presentation is about, but you probably know that you have to um, determine the risk. You have to do a risk rating of your clients um, and you have to categorize them into high, medium or low risk or, or whatever. Um, risk categories you, you might possibly have more it depends on your unique circumstances um, but um, the, the, how you verify your client is to, de is to be determined on the risk that you allocated uh, to those clients to a certain extent. Uh, verification must occur during the course of conducting the single transaction or business relationship it must be completed uh, but the verification must be completed uh, before the transaction is concluded. So um, if I can use the estate agents again as an example, if somebody gives you a mandate to find the property or to sell his property, um, at that stage, uh, you haven't done the transaction, uh, you can start uh, collecting the information from the client, but you have to have everything in place before you can actually um, close the, 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 the deal and before the transaction is actually concluded. So, um, as Yolandi said earlier, um, if, you, if you do business with um, legal entities, trusts and partnerships, you need to do additional due diligence on those uh, clients. So, Section 21, Capital B of the FIC Act is very specific on, on what information, or not what information, but on how you must go about uh, getting behind the corporate veil and, and determining who the actual beneficial owner of this legal entity is. Um, and as I said, with a business relationship, with all business relationships, you need to understand the nature of the client's business. Um, if you deal with a, with a legal uh, client, legal person as a client, you also need to understand the ownership and control structure of the client. In other words, who ultimately owns it and who controls it. Um, it might be the same person, it might be different people. Um, you have to identify and take reasonable steps to verify the beneficial owner. So once you, just like an individual once-off uh, transaction, once-off deal, uh, you have to get the information and then you have to verify the information on the beneficial owner. Now, doing that would reduce the heightened risk when dealing with legal persons, trusts and partnerships. Because as Yulandi said earlier, 
uh, it is possible that criminals may use these um, arrangements and and, pers and legal persons uh, to hide, um, you know, their um, um, uh, funds and, and, and uh, their uh, money. Um, so um, you mitigate this risk by understanding who is the beneficial owner. So obviously, once you've determined who the beneficial owner is, that might put them or put the transaction immediately in a, in a high risk category. But um, it, it's not necessarily like that. Um, the fact is you need to, to get the information and then that will, that will um, contribute to your understanding of the risk and to what extent you will take actions to mitigate and to manage that risk. Um, the idea is to uh, pierce the corporate veil. Um, in other words, to find out who is the warm body behind uh, the client that are doing business as a legal entity. OK, so what is a beneficial ownership? I think um, Yolandi already touched on that. But the, the FIC Act defines a beneficial owner in respect of a legal person as the natural person or independently, who independently or together with another person owns the legal person or exercises effective control of the legal person. So you will see that um, we are talking here about an individual natural person who controls or owns this legal person. So what is a legal person? The FIC Act has got a definition for that as well. It, a legal person is defined in terms of the act as any person other than a natural person that establishes a business relationship or enters into a single transaction with an accountable institution, and it includes a person incorporates, incorporated as a company, close corporation, foreign company, or any other form of corporate arrangements or association. It excludes a trust, a partnership, or a sole proprietor. Uh, proprietor. So we'll get to trusts and partnerships a bit later. Uh, a legal entity would then be, in the South African context, a company or closed corporation, but it could also be um, another form of corporate arrangement or association. Um, I, I'm not so familiar with, with uh, you know, what you would get in other countries, but if it's a foreign uh, client, you need to determine whether it's perhaps a legal uh, person. The, F, the Financial Action Task Force refers to the term legal arrangement, and this is uh, to cover, um, or this is covered in the FIC Act's definition of under, uh, uh, it's covered under any other form of corporate arrangement or association. That is to make provision for the Financial Action Task Force um, term uh, of legal arrangement. Um, so as we said, there are different forms of legal persons with, with which an accountable institution may establish a business relationship. Uh, and or conduct a single ones of transaction. A, uh, an accountable institution are required in terms of section 42 of the FIC Act to provide um, for the, the way and the processes by which the institution conducts additional due diligence measures in respect of um, legal persons. So as I mentioned earlier, section 42 deals with um, the risk management and compliance program it sets out all the requirements um, that, that needs to be included in the in the in the RMCP, and uh, you will find uh, this specific requirement under Section 42F uh, in the if I, uh, in the FIC Act. Um, so basically, uh, thanks, Yolandi. That is that is all on that. I will now explain to you um, what the Act say in Section 21B about. Um, the process of um, identifying and verifying the beneficial owners uh, in the FIC uh, or, or, or the beneficial owners of a, of, a, um, of a client, if the client is a legal entity. So in Section 21B2 uh, of the Act, um, there's very specific um, processes and procedures and steps that you have to take when you do um, customer uh, customer identification or customer due diligence on, on your client. And uh, you have to start by identifying each natural person who has a controlling ownership interest in the legal person. In other words, who owns the shares that will give him or control uh, 
to that legal uh, person. Once you've done that, and let me just say that it's very important to understand that these steps are, it's very specific in the act that, 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 that they say that um, you have to start with the first step. And only if that doesn't work and you, you're not able to, to identify who's the controlling ownership interest, the, the shareholder that controls the, the um, institution by way of his or her shareholding, only then you can go over um, to the next step, which is to identify each natural person who exercises control over that legal person through other means like uh, proxy or um, shareholders agreement or something like that, delegation of authority or something like that. Um, if that doesn't work, if you after you've taken that step, still is not in a position uh, to identify and verify the beneficial owner of this legal entity, only then can you go to the third step uh, where you exercise, where, where you identify the natural persons who exercise control control over the management of that legal person. In other words, here you're looking at the directors um, who ultimately calls the shots and then also um, the management of, of the institutions who are then um, taking instructions from the, director, the directors to, to run the institution. So um, to continue on the scheme, controlling ownership interest, to effectively determine who are the natural person or persons who has the controlling ownership in a legal entity, an accountable institution must understand the legal person's ownership and control structure. And understand exactly which natural persons exercises influence over decisions taken and or uh, operations uh, undertaken. Um, the different types of legal persons have different forms of ownership interest. For example, companies, it is straightforward, they have shareholders. Cooperative members um, own interest that is referred to as membership shares. Then you could have a close corporation where the members have an interest in that um, close corporation. So um, to give you some more examples, I know Yulandi have given one example already, but uh, to give you more examples on uh, how you would determine the beneficial owner in a controlling ownership uh, interest situation is um, we've, we've, we've put on an example there um, and um, it is not, I understand that there are much more complicated uh, possible scenarios out there. Uh, we, we surely can't cover everything in the presentation, so uh, we've tried to simplify it just to bring the message over. So um, in this example that we have here, we have company X, who's got an authorized representative and uh, he or she then wanted to wants to buy a property on behalf of the company. Company X is owned uh, by company a, uh, by company E. So company E has got all the shares or a controlling ownership interest at least in company X. Now you have to go back to, to determine who owns company E. Because you remember you need to get to a natural person, the warm body behind the corporate veil. So uh, now you find that person S or individual S owns controlling ownership interest in company E, who then in, in turn owns controlling ownership in, com in, in company X, who is your client. So uh, person S therefore owns controlling ownership uh, in, in uh, uh, shares of company X through company E. And in this instance, you then need to identify and verify the information on natural person S. Another example, we have here um, company M, uh, the authorized user of company M wants to open a bank account on behalf of the company. Company M is owned by two uh, other companies, being company E, the own half the controlling ownership interest, and company T owns the other half of the controlling ownership interest. So, um, so you've identified now that the shareholders are those two companies, but you have to go uh, further up the line because uh, those are not uh, natural persons. So now you find out that person S, individual S, owns the controlling ownership interest in company E, and individuals um, R and individual X owns 
a part controlling company in company T. So those three individuals are then actually ultimately um, controlling company M, who is the client of the accountable institution. So those three then uh, those those three individuals S, R, and X then needs to be identified and verified as the ultimate beneficial owners of the client. So as we said earlier, beneficial ownership uh, can be can be um, uh, exercised through different uh, means. Um, different a natural person can exercise effective control over a legal person by other means in different ways. For example, with the power of attorney, uh, by using nominee shareholders, delegation of authority, uh, delegated authority in terms of law, where there's legislation and an accounting officer or then uh, a court order, for example, or a shareholders agreement or something like that. Uh, the, the, the message is basically that um, it doesn't mean that if the shares belong to a certain uh, institution or person, that that institution or person has control over that institution. So just an example of uh, how we, um, ex or to explain our issue of, of uh, uh, control. Uh, in our example here, you have company X, whose authorized representative wants to open a bank account on behalf of the company. Um, company X is owned by company E and company T. And in this instance, uh, individual P exercises a proxy voting rights on behalf of company E. So the shareholders there have given their, um, uh, their voting rights to, to uh, individual P to act on their behalf. Um, then you also have uh, person Q and person R who exercise the proxy voting rights on behalf of the shareholders of company T. So in this instance, these three individuals then control uh, uh, company, uh, companies E and T and ultimately therefore also controls company X, uh, who, who is then the, um, the client of the accountable institution. Then, um, as I mentioned, the, the third um, scenario that you can get if, you, if you're not able to identify the ultimate uh, beneficial owner by way of shareholding or by, by way of control, only then can you go to the third step, uh, which is to then identify and verify uh, the control uh, over the, or the management of, of the institution. So in this example, we have company O, which is controlled by six directors. And our company O's authorized representative wants to buy a property on behalf of company O. So in this instance, you see that company O is owned by, uh, in our example, a thousand individuals, and each have uh, a very small percentage of, of the shares. And so the voting rights is, um, is, is distributed between all those individuals. And now you have to um, you're not able to, to identify one specific person as, a, as the ultimate beneficial owner by way of shareholding, also not by way of control over the institution. So in this instance, you would go to the management of the institution. You need to identify and verify um, the company, uh, the company's authorized representative, and then also the directors of the company. And, and also the management, if uh, one of the directors is not... Uh, uh, the only manager, you also need to uh, make sure that you know who the management are and who takes the decisions within that institution. Then we get to we come to trusts and beneficial owners. As you know, um, trust in South Africa and all over the world is a, is a special um, arrangement between, between individuals. It doesn't have legal, um, it's not a legal person. Uh, but the FIC Act is also very clear on um, on, on how you need to, to do customer due diligence on trusts. And I must say, this doesn't um, differ too much from what was in the old uh, uh, regulations uh, before the, the introduction of the of the um, risk-based approach. So in our example here, you have Trust X, who's got an authorized representative who, who wants to open a bank account on behalf of the trust. So in the trust situation, you have different individuals. You could have a donor or founder, and you have trustees 
multiple individuals. And then you have um, beneficiaries who could be named or not necessarily be named. So in this instance, we have to then do customer due diligence on, uh, on uh, the trust itself. You need to determine uh, where, the, where the trust is registered, with which office of the master of the high court it is registered, what is the, the name of the trust, what is the um, number of the trust, the registration number, the address of the, of the trust, um, in other words, basically all information on the trust itself. Um, you also need to then uh, do due diligence on the, the individuals, the, the authorized representative of the trust, on the donor, and also on the trustees, individual trustees, as well as those beneficiaries that are named um, in the trust deed. Um, where there is no beneficiaries named, you need to determine in terms of the act, how um, how the trustees would go about to determine who the beneficial owners uh, or the beneficiaries of their trust actually is. And, and that process, how they do that, would then be included um, in, your, um, um, in your risk management and compliance program, um, you know, if, if uh, you, because you have to determine how that is, how that is done. And then you need to include how you are going to determine, um, you know, how, how they, they do this. Um, so that's basically what you need to, to get on the trust. Let me just say that for trust and for, and for um, um, partnerships and also for um, legal persons, the only way to really um, do this is to actually get hold of the trustee or the, or the um, shareholders agreement, um, the memorandum of, of incorporation of a company, or in the instance of partnerships of the partnership agreement. The only way to do this is actually to get hold of these documents and to make sure that you understand these documents and that it makes sense to you and uh, that, um, you know, what, what whatever is in there is, uh, is, is clear. Okay, so um, on our next slide, we talk about partnerships and beneficial owners. So partnerships also come in various uh, sizes and shapes. Um, it's basically an agreement, as you know, between different uh, partners, and it, it could be uh, uh, full profit sharing or it could be limited partnerships, uh, whatever the case might be. As I said, it would be good practice to get hold of the partnership arrangement or agreement in order to better understand uh, the partnerships, uh, the partnership and its beneficial owners. So in our example here, you have partnership X, Y, and Z uh, who wants to open a bank account. So uh, those, uh, the partners in that institution is part, basically those three uh, individuals, partner X, partner Y, and partner Z. And um, what you need to do in terms of customer due diligence is you need to identify and verify um, the different partners, all of them, and then also the, the uh, uh, authorized representative who act on behalf of the partnership. So um, you need to obtain the information on those individuals. So um, the FIC Act also say that um, if there's an inability to conduct customer due diligence or to obtain the additional due diligence information or to conduct ongoing due diligence because um, the Act requires you to, to do ongoing due diligence because situations and um, uh, institutions may change over time, so you need to be up to speed um, with what uh, you know is happening in your in your clients, in your corporate clients. Um, if you are not able to do that, that then uh, in terms of the legislation, you are not allowed to establish a business relationship or conduct a single transaction. And if you already have them on your books, you need to ex to, to terminate um, the, that relationship with that client. Um, and then obviously, in that, those instances, you, you must consider filing a suspicious or, un or unusual transaction as per Section 29 of the FIC Act. But um, it, it doesn't mean that you immediately file a transaction. Obviously, you need to do some, um, some research and some investigation to see whether it's really necessary uh, to file 
um, such a, a report. So that's all from my side for now. I'm going to hand you back to Yulandi, and she's going to talk about um, the, what we used to call in the old act uh, as, as PIPs, particularly in exposed persons, but uh, we have some very really fancy um, uh, definitions and explanations now. Yulandi will give you further information on that. Thank you very much. Um, we'll talk to you again at the question and answer session. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, uh, Bella. So really, if anything, if anything, if you walk away from today's session, understanding the process that Philip just outlined now, then we would have achieved our purpose for, for today's session. The process of elimination as set out in Section 21B of the FIC Act. That set, sets out the steps exactly that you need to follow when uh, identifying and taking reasonable steps to verify your uh, uh, the beneficial owner of your client that is a legal person. There's another scenario when you onboard your, your client. So your client is a legal person. That legal person is owned by a beneficial owner and that beneficial owner is then either a foreign prominent public official or a domestic prominent influential person. So just before I, I, I go further into that scenario, you'll, you'll be asking who is exactly a foreign prominent public official and who is a domestic prominent influential person. If you look at Schedule 3A, it sets out a list of positions of domestic prominent influential persons. And then Schedule 3B of the FIG Act, it sets out a list of positions of foreign prominent public officials. Examples of a domestic prominent influential person is a member of parliament, um, municipal manager, president, judges, so forth. So immediately when your client um, is a domestic prominent influential person, Additional requirements apply in terms of uh, the FIC Act. So if your client as a natural person is a deep, uh, deep up for short, additional requirements will, will re apply. The same applies if your beneficial, the beneficial owner of your client is a deep up. Then as well, uh, the, the, the sections are section 21 F, G and H of the FIC Act. And there those sections state that when dealing with um, a deeper or an high risk, um, at least a foreign prominent public official or a high risk domestic prominent influential person, or their family members or known close associates of those persons, then the accountable institution must obtain senior management approval to establish the business relationship. In addition to obtaining the source of funds information, they must also obtain the source of wealth information. And they must also conduct enhanced due diligence monitoring. And, and this really, for the South African context, I really want to emphasize that this applies when you're dealing with a client that is a legal person, you have to have to check whether or not that client's beneficial owners are either a domestic prominent influential person or foreign prominent public official. You'll find that in various instances, there has been found that, um, um, as I've mentioned earlier, legal persons are used as um, entities to, 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 to hide corrupt money or so forth. So you need to identify those risks and um, also mitigate it. Again, uh, even if the client, the beneficial owner does not uh, fall in the list of foreign prominent public officials or domestic prominent influential persons, if you find any negative information on that beneficial owner, that beneficial owner is linked to any um, predicate offenses, criminal offenses or so forth, you can still treat that relationship with your client as high risk. And you can still, in terms of your risk-based approach, 
as an accountable institution. You can still put in place measures um, that are enhanced, uh, such as the measures of obtaining senior management approval or establishing the source of wealth or conducting enhanced uh, due diligence monitoring on the client. So don't let it stop at um, just whether they are at a steep up, so FPPLs. If they that beneficial owner is high risk for any other reason, apply enhanced due diligence measures to that business relationship with your client who is the legal person. And on to targeted financial sanctions. So the base of uh, target, the targeted financial sanctions regime here in South Africa, if you look at uh, Section 28A of the Financial Intelligence Center Act, it basically states that an accountable institution must scrutinize client information, of which client information actually includes beneficial owners' information, and they must scrutinize it or screen it at least against the targeted financial sanctions lists. Those lists are published in terms of Section 26A of the FIC Act and Section 25 of Pogtatara. So you'll see Section 26A, a list, uh, and, and yeah, I'd like to refer you to uh, Public Compliance Communication 44, which sets out the two regimes that are followed in South Africa. Um, the list that is published in terms of Section 26A is published on the FIC website. And you can have a look on the FIC website and, and screen your client information, which includes your beneficial owner, the beneficial owner information against that list on the FIC website. Then the list in terms of Section 25 of Oktatara, it is published on the United Nations Security Council website. You can go onto the UNSC website, search for Consolidated Sanctions list, and uh, that whole list will come up. You can screen your client name and all the beneficial owners' names against that list. If you do find that somebody is on that list, you cannot proceed to provide or facilitate financing to that client. So the accountable institution may not establish a business relationship or conduct a single transaction on behalf of a sanctioned person. So it's very important that you screen your clients when you onboard them, and it's very important that you continue to screen your clients when those lists are updated. If you identify a sanctioned person, don't proceed to provide services to that person. This diagram just shows you the process of how uh, financial sanctions are implemented in South Africa and how you become aware of it. So if you start right on top there, uh, you'll see that the United Nations Security Council, when they make updates or changes to the resolutions that deals with targeted financial sanctions, those changes or updates are sent through to the Department of International Relations and Cooperation here in South Africa. Then uh, that Department of International Relations and Co Cooperation in South Africa sends out an alert to the Minister of Finance, and also to the director. Uh, the director, in terms of the FIC Act, will then publish um, uh, any um, lists in terms of se Section 26, 26A on the FIC Act. And then also you'll find that um, the other list is available on the UNSC website, as I've mentioned. It's also available on the SAPS website the list that is published by Gazette in terms of Pogtatara. You can go onto the FIC website and subscribe to a mailing list. So go on and click on the international tab and target financial sanctions. Subscribe to the mailing list. It will send you updates on the one list that is published in terms of Section 26A. You can then uh, screen your client against that. If you pick up any clients that are, or prospective clients that are matched against uh, anybody on the targeted financial sanctions list, you must then proceed to report through to the center. And I'll touch on the reporting a bit later, but the reports that are available to the accountable and reporting institutions are terrorist property reports, suspicious and unusual transaction reports, 
for suspicious and unusual activity reports. Uh, those are the type of reports that you can file through. If you suspect that somebody is on the list or you know definitely somebody is on the list and you have in your possession property of that sanctioned entity. There's also in terms of Section 26C, a process where you can apply for permitted financial sanctions, but I won't cover that in today's session. Uh, you can just have a look at 20, uh, Section 26C and, and, and see that process there. Then, um, yeah, it's a process of ongoing uh, screening and making sure that you're not dealing with sanctioned persons. Please have a look at that public compliance communication 44. Also, just to uh, just to highlight for foreign prominent public officials and domestic prominent influential persons, a draft PCC has been published. Um, also go onto the FIC website, you'll see there is a draft PCC which deals with these type of entities, provides you with a bit more guidance on it. Uh, final version of that draft um, is intended to be published quite soon, so also have a look out for that final version on the website. So then that takes me to um, risk indicators. So there's various potential risk indicators that uh, point towards a heightened risk of money laundering or terrorist financing when you're dealing with um, legal entities and their beneficial owners. So you need to see if there's any allegations of money laundering, terrorist financing, proliferation financing, bribery, corruption, or any other offense uh, that involves that beneficial owner or the legal person. Also consider if the beneficial owner has a reputation of unethical conduct. That could point towards a risk factor. The beneficial owner, or if whether the beneficial owner is associated to persons who have been convicted of bribery and corruption or any other predicate offence. Um, check whether the beneficial owner themselves have been previously charged with corruption and, and has um, not been acquitted or have they been previously charged for money laundering or terrorist financing? Or is there a probe or an investigation around that beneficial owner that's currently taking place? All of those factors factor them into the overall risk rating of your client. Further potential risk indicators include whether the beneficial owner controls public funds or controls public benefits. Um, just consider that, that it might indicate a vulnerability uh, to potential corruption or so forth. Check whether the beneficial owner is a domestic prominent influential person or foreign prominent public official or any other type of high risk um, uh, person. Again, there, there's a susceptibility to, to, to heighten the risk of corruption or, or bribery in that instance. We are legal person, we are legal entity avoids providing beneficial ownership information. This is a key um, risk indicator. So if you're dealing with that client that's a legal person and that legal person just the authorized representative just does not want to provide information on the shareholder or um, the directors or so forth, you must a red flag should be uh, alarming in your mind. Why would they want to um, hide the beneficial ownership information? So that's a clear risk indicator. Then the legal entities have been awarded large or numerous tenders from government. So there, when you onboard your client, it's a legal person, and uh, you see that that legal person deals a lot, uh, has a lot of tenders or so. Uh, also, just do further investigation, do further due diligence, and see whether there's any negative reports on that entity or so forth. It could be, it could indicate a vulnerability um, on that side, on that business um, entity side. Legal entities account activity does not align to the stated source of wealth and source of funds. So there the legal entity stated that they receive um, um, monthly income on, on uh, 
and they've given you a, a certain threshold or so, but obviously you can see the activity that takes place across their account does not align to that stated uh, to that stated um, income of that legal entity. Then the legal entity's assets acquired does not align to the legal entity's source of funds and income. Again, they stated they have a, a, a certain amount of income per month that the, the business generates as profit. But if you look at the assets and what they've acquired over a, a certain period of time, it just does not align. All of these things, although not definite indicators of money laundering or so, it does uh, indicate potential risk. So you can just do additional due diligence on it. And then there's a example that was quite widely reported on here, and I and I'll also ask if Philip has any other pointers to add onto this. Um, he, he can do so, but um, yeah, I just want to highlight that uh, Panama Papers, right? There was an uh, entity in Panama, an attorney firm, Mosek Fonseca, which basically assisted numerous uh, different um, different uh, persons around the globe to open up front companies. Um, and those front companies were then used to evade taxes. Uh, there was uh, illicit funds that run, ran through those front companies' uh, bank accounts and so forth. So, so there, there was a whole um, orchestrated or organized um, scheme in terms of which numerous beneficial owners, and beneficial owners were from various areas around the world. Uh, they included um, politicians and high profile business uh, persons and so forth. This just shows the risk of, of how beneficial owners use uh, companies uh, to manipulate those companies or misuse those companies for um, criminal behavior and so forth. So it's very important for you as the accountable institution when you open, when you establish a business relationship with a beneficial owner, with a legal person. Establish who exactly owns that legal person, who is benefiting from that relationship. What's also unique about this Panama Papers situation, it, it showed the difficulty of um, getting information uh, across border information. So if you're dealing with a company that's based in another country, um, oftentimes obtaining that beneficial ownership information is going to pr prove a, a challenge to you. Um, and in therein lies a vulnerability because uh, that criminal, there might be a criminal entity that knows exactly that, you know, it is a challenge for these accountable institutions to obtain the beneficial ownership information. So they tend to manipulate um, um, uh, legal entities for this uh, use. I don't know if Philip wants to add to you. Um, thanks, Yolandi. Um, not really, honestly, but um, I would encourage you to have time. I'm really about Panama Papers. It's a very interesting meeting. Um, and um, it has changed um, my understanding the way that journalists are and you know, investigators are doing their work. Um, and it, it um, led to uh, some very uh, high profile politicians. Um, you're having to 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 resign if i remember correctly it was the prime minister of denmark who actually um, resigned following the, the panama papers and um, there were also a lot of uh, very prominent sports and entertain uh, you know uh, movie stars and entertainment people um, that were using these um, facilities to hide some of their um, some of the income and and i think it was mainly for tax evasion purposes um, that they used this uh, this facilities that was provided by by Mossack Fonseca. Now, Mossack Fonseca had um, uh, offices in various parts of the world, so uh, they were assisting their their clients um, all over the world to uh, set up uh, companies and set up um, front front companies to to front some of their assets to hide it from from a tax by uh, the tax man. Um, it doesn't need to necessarily only be the tax man. People also do this um, 
to hide uh, income and, and assets from uh, from creditors in, in certain instances, even from their family members or their spouses or ex-spouses and so on. So uh, it's it's something that um, is, as you said, and as, as it was proven by the Panama Papers amongst, which is just one example, it is a widely used, um, uh, you, you know, throughout the world um, that, that people are trying to hide their assets and their income by setting up um, uh, you know, these front companies. Thanks, that's all I wanted to add to that. Sorry, a bit of gremlins script in there. So yes, very interesting case. Thanks, Philip, for that uh, summary. We do urge you to go and have a look at uh, the Panama Papers and just... Um, a bit of technical error, yeah? I think swap over. Frozen. So yes, I, I think there's a bit of technical. Uh, I'm dealing with a bit of a technical glitch here in that the the the, the presentation has just frozen. Please be with us. I'm just uh, trying to establish what is. Um, the challenge with the presentation. Studies. Just hold it here for a minute. Sorry, we've picked up just a bit of a technical glitch. We're trying to sort that out. We'll be with you just in a minute. I think while well, you're ready, we can maybe just add something which is sort of related to the issue of the Panama Papers. Um, I think accountable institutions must keep in mind that um, you know, getting all this information and making sure who you are ultimately doing business with. It's a requirement of the FIC Act and, and therefore you have to do it. But it goes wider than that. Um, surely institutions wants to, um, w want to, to um, protect their uh, reputation. So um, it is a, it's a very large reputational risk for you to do business with, with somebody that, um, with somebody that you don't know who it is. So um, if you, if, if you, you know, I, I would advise you to, as far as possible, establish who you are doing business with, not only for compliance with the FIC Act purposes, but also um, for your own, for the protection of your own reputation. So you don't want to read in the newspaper, uh, you know, that you've been involved in, in money laundering or tax evasion, or that you were assisting your clients with those sort of um, activities. So. Um, it's very important, therefore, that from from that perspective, which, is, which goes a bit wider than just um, complying uh, with with, um, with with the FIC Act. Um, so thanks. I think Yolanda is ready again, and she will continue. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yes, um, the presentation seems to have frozen, but we're back again. So. Yes, uh, just to follow from where we left off in terms of the risk based approach. There you'll see um, just high level. The accountable institution, obviously, when you onboard your client, you must assess the risk uh, that your client poses and where your client poses a higher risk. If that client is a high risk, a domestic prominent influential person or the beneficial owner, 
um, of that legal entity at least is a deeper or so forth. You must put in place controls that uh, mitigate um, mitigate that risk. So there's different factors that you uh, take into account when you risk rate, obviously. High level, your products and services, your delivery channels, the geographic location, the client type, and other factors. We're just going to zoom for a second into the client type, because uh, that's where the beneficial owner obviously um, plays a role when you're determining the overall risk of your client. So if you look at client type, you'll see that certain types of legal, you look at the various legal entities, you'll see that the various legal entities pose um, a risk, uh, pose differing levels of risk at least. And you will risk rate the different types of legal entities. And obviously you gain an understanding of the beneficial owners. You identify the beneficial owners there. And um, that is it. You incorporate that into your overall risk rating. So I think it will be, make a bit more sense in the, this next slide. So yeah, for example, if you onboard a client and that client, you screen the, the, uh, the beneficial owners and you pick up that that beneficial is, owner is sanctioned. That's obviously the highest risk. And in that instance, you in actual fact cannot proceed to establish that business relationship. You'll see that first example there. If you look, if you onboard a client and you screen the beneficial owner and you find that that beneficial owner is not sanctioned and there's no negative findings on that beneficial owner, then it gives you some sense of um, that perhaps that might pose a, a lower risk or medium to lower risk in that instance dealing with that legal entity. Then and the next type of scenario is where you onboard a legal entity and that legal entity has a beneficial owner that is in actual fact a foreign prominent public official. So they obviously, in terms of Section 21, um, F, G and H, you would know that when dealing with an FBPO, they automatically deemed higher risk. So there you'd have to put in place those um, controls of obtaining the senior management approval um, and getting the source of wealth information and so forth. The same goes for when you are dealing with a high risk, deep up uh, beneficial owner. There also, it's a high risk, put in place those controls as per 21G of the FIC Act. So this, this um, table is just illustrative. The scoring in this table is merely for illustrated illustration purposes only. Uh, you as an accountable institution, you implement your own risk based approach. And um, key to that is documenting the risk based approach. Uh, document the manner in which you risk rate a business relationship. Document the manner in which you identify and take reasonable steps to verify your beneficial owner. All of that, again, as Philip mentioned, Section 42 states that you must document your processes. So when you are subject to an inspection in future, if you have those documented processes and you follow the, the, the requirements of the FIC Act, hopefully then it would place you in a better, better place. I'm almost coming to the final slides. Uh, again, I urge you to send through whatever questions you have on, um, on the topic. So the transaction monitoring. Uh, yeah, an accountable institution must monitor transactions, establish the source of funds to ensure it is consistent with the client's business and risk profile and establish background and purpose of all complex transactions. So that goes for all your clients, whether it's a, whether your client is a legal person or so, you must do this for all your clients. Again, if you have doubts of veracity, You've obtained the beneficial ownership information. You have doubts about the veracity. Then you must repeat the steps, um, the identification and verification steps as set out in the FIC Act and your RMCP. Then on to reporting. There are different types of reports. You'll see there are 
Section 28, CTR reporting, that's cash threshold reporting. Uh, Section 28A, terrorist property reporting. I've mentioned this report. If you screen your, your beneficial owner, when you screen your beneficial owner, and you find that there is a sanctioned person, and you've got in your possession property or funds of that sanctioned person, you would file what's called a TPR in terms of Section 28A. Then Section 29 is a suspicious and unusual transaction report. There, if you suspect that you're dealing with somebody who is either sanctioned or you've got a, there's any suspicious and unusual activity or transaction, you can file through that report or you should in actual fact, you must in actual fact file through that report in terms of Section 29. And then the last report type I won't cover right now, that is still um, yet to come into force. So that brings us to our Q&A. And I'll ask that our producer at this point leave it on the Q&A slide while we then look at the questions. And um, what I will do is um, I'll just read through all the questions and wherever uh, I'll just aim it towards uh, if I need to aim it towards Philip, then I'll do so. OK, so first off, guys, the register is available. That link on top, the very first link is the register. Please do uh, complete the link. Where do you get the, so that's the attendance register. You will get a copy of these slides. The slides will be made available to all the persons who has um, registered. So yeah, I see who is the beneficial owner of a business is owned by Family Trust. Martin, your question is very good. Uh, it's very, very, um, it's a complex uh, situation, but um, very good. Nonetheless, I'll ask Philip, please, to um, respond. Thank you, Landy. Um, so in the next question, he actually said that uh, it was covered. Um, but just to reiterate that um, the, the act is very specific on who needs to be um, identified and verified when you're dealing with a trust, either directly or uh, with a company who's owned then by a trust. So in that instance, you will uh, do customer due diligence on the person acting on behalf of the trust. You will do customer due diligence on the founder or the donor, then also on the trustees, as well as the beneficiaries where those beneficiaries are, are um, mentioned by now the trust deed. So basically, you would have to obtain the trust deed and work through that to see uh, that you've got all the information. Um, because apart from the individuals that needs to be identified and verified, uh, identified and verified, you also need to um, identify the trust itself. You need to, to determine um, which uh, office of the of the master of the high court it is registered at and what the registration number is. Uh, so you need also to obtain that information in respect of the trust, either as a direct line or as um, the, the beneficial owner then of um, a, a company or another legal institution. Thanks, I think that covers it. You're welcome to ask more. Yes, please do send through questions. If you have any questions, we can uh, address them now. There's not that many. I see there was a uh, issue with sound. I hope that is uh, fixed. Um, Yes, there is uh, recordings available on the FIC YouTube channel. Uh, you can go on to the Financial Intelligence uh, YouTube channel. There is certain recordings available there. Just on the trust point that uh, Philip was mentioning, now, I just want to pose a, an additional scenario to you, Philip. What if the beneficiaries or so are in actual fact themselves legal entities? Or what if uh, one of the uh, uh, trustees or so is a legal entity. What would then the course be of action be in that instance? How would you take steps to identify those that type of scenario? Okay, where where the trustee is a legal entity, um, it, it sometimes happened that uh, you know with a family trust, the, the family appoints uh, the trust 
department or trust division of a bank or, a, or an attorney firm to help them. So in that instance, there will be one person who would then act as the trustee of that family trust, and, and that person will then represent, um, you know, the the, the uh, attorney firm or the or the bank, as the case may be. So that person then needs to be verified and identified because that's the individual who's who's appointed by the master of the high court as a as the trustee uh, of of that trust. Um, the other question, Yolandi, was about uh, if, if the beneficiary is a legal entity. In that instance, um, you would have to, to look at then um, who are the, the natural people behind uh, that legal entity. And we've explained that um, you have to look at, you know, who owns the, the shares or who controls the company or who manages the company. Those three steps um, in, in that order. So you would have to go back to, to determine then who is the um, the ultimate controller of, of that trust. Yes, yes, definitely. So you have to drill down if the name beneficiaries are, or if the beneficiaries are legal entity, you definitely have to go down still to that natural person who is the beneficial owner of that. The same would apply with partnerships. If your partnerships are made up of uh, various legal entities, again, there, uh, each partner in their own right is a legal entity. You'd have to go down and establish who is the natural person, who's the beneficial owner of that partner. And that's all um, under in terms of 21B. Then the next question, and I'll also uh, ask uh, Philip to, if the majority shareholder of a legal entity is a listed company, do we then obtain the financial statement of the listed company and then ascertain who exercises control of the listed company? So they want to know, do they have to obtain financial statements of the legal, of the listed company? And will also, uh, do they have to determine who exercises control of the legal company? Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Lindy, and thanks for the question. Uh, yes, like with any other um, legal uh, person, client, you need to determine who, who's the individual that um, controls the company. So if it's a listed company and uh, and there's not a, a specific shareholder who, who's actually uh, the majority shareholder, then it, it could become a bit tricky. So you would have to go to the next step, which is then to find out who is uh, in, in control of the company by any other means than, than just owning the shares. If that uh, doesn't give you an answer, then you would have to go to the management. Um, as far as the, the um, um, financial statements of the company is concerned, that, that would give you a lot of information on the company. Um, a lot of these listed institutions would also have um, annual reports, possibly, that will give you some information. Um, then also, if, if the company is listed, let's say, on, on, on the JSE, then uh, it would also make sense to have a look at uh, the JSE um, SENS announcements to determine whether there's been any um, news specifically on this institution, uh, because insofar as it relates to their dividend policy and shares issued and so on, uh, that information needs to be made available on um, on the, the, the SENS, which is the JSE's um, news page, if I can call it that. Uh, so it will also make, make sense to, to have a look at that. Um, so you need to get this information about the beneficial owners, like we've explained, but uh, it will also make good sense to have a look at, at additional information, and you'll also find a lot of information um, in open source, um, uh, you know, information and, and, and search um, engines and so on. Um, on. On an institution, because you remember, you need to also establish um, the source of funds, you need to establish the, the intention of the business and the nature of the business that this, that this client is doing. So, um, yeah, you, you must go and read as wide as possible uh, before you accept that, that person as, as a client. Thanks for that, Philip. Then the next question again, I'm going to ask you to respond. Where can we get access to information? on persons not on the UN list, but have been found guilty of unethical conduct or corruption within SA. 
For example, can they get the information from court papers or which sources exactly should they uh, rely on for this type of information? Um, well, well, in all honesty, my, my short answer is I, I'm not sure. Um, no, I think, you know, again, if, if you use a search in engine for that person's name, it is it will most probably give you some information. Uh, you know, if, if you if you just, um, you know, go into it, uh, sort of open source information. Um, maybe I said, I'm, I'm honestly not sure whether, whether you know, the, the NPA would keep something like that, but, you know, I would I would suggest maybe just have a look at the National Prosecuting Authority's website to see if they have a, a history of, um, of, of of cases and who's been involved and so on. Um, yeah, I I think that's something that we can maybe find out for you and come back. Um, I'm sure if you maybe want to lodge a um, a public compliance query with us, and then we can we can get more information. And I just want to to check with the uh, National Prosecuting Authority. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where to find, um, you know, a list of court cases. Um, but yeah, open source information will already go a long way to, to assist you. Thank, thank you, Philip. Yes, so there, there's various also, I, I just want to add to what Philip was saying, there's various other commercial databases that you can rely on for information on a client, whether or not they have past convictions or so forth. There are those commercial databases, these public sources. So we don't prescribe what exactly um, sources the accountable institution needs to rely on. But um, whatever source the accountable institution chooses to rely on, they must just make sure that it's accurate information that they're getting and it, it's actually current information that they are relying on um, and obviously independent information. So again, if you look at um, guidance note 7, it does state that the accountable institution has the flexibility to choose the information that they, um, the information that they, um, require and also the sources that they use to verify that information against. Um, yeah, like Philip mentioned, if you guys have any other further, because I see there's not that many questions. OK, I see one question. Um, and I think I'll take this question here. How does the Popia Act? How does the Popia, that's the Protection of Personal Information Act, impact on what the FIC and AIs are doing. I see the reports, I see the I reports, the information regulator reports directly to the National Assembly. So there it's quite simple. The, this, uh, the protection of personal information obviously provides for certain conditions for processing of information. There's, uh, I think there's eight of them or so. And of those conditions, it states that um, the uh, processor or the accountable institution, the data processor sh needs to get, um, uh, needs to have a justification for processing information. So that justification is uh, basically found in that the, the FIC Act requires in terms of law that an accountable institution gather certain personal information and they process that certain information. So the accountable institution is obligated in terms of legislation to gather that uh, personal information. And that obligation is basically the justification for processing of personal information. Uh, the FIC Act and uh, the Protection of Personal Information Act actually complement one another. Uh, they work hand in hand. So you you obtaining information from as an accountable institution you're obtaining information from your client you are compliant with the fic act and you are compliant with the conditions that set out on, in papier obviously there's other conditions there you need to keep it safe you need to only process it for the purpose for which you're obtaining you you, you shouldn't get too much information information uh, you shouldn't um whatever your information that you do get shouldn't be excessive. Obviously, it should be necessary for the purposes that you are obtaining it for. Just again, FIC Act and POPIA works hand in hand. They complement one another. So 
you have to comply with your obligations in terms of big act. If a client states to you that they're not going to provide information based on Papua, um, there clearly, uh, I think it's section 21E of the big act states, if you can't CDD, if you're unable to CDD, uh, you cannot enter into that business relationship. And uh, obviously, if there's an existing business relationship, you should consider terminating and also consider if there's a case for um, a Section 29 report, if needs be. I don't know, is there one last question? I'll just have a look. So uh, it's another one. So is the FIC exempted, excluded in terms of Section 6 of Papia? Yes, there is an exclusion in terms of Section FIC, Section um, 6 of Papia that applies to um, um, the, the, the FIC. However, if you look at Section 41A of the FIC Act, it does state there is certain provisions that uh, the FIC as an, uh, as an organization has to comply with. Um, when dealing with uh, personal information, and that, that's around safeguarding it and and so forth. I think that brings us with the one last question. Oh yes, there is one last question. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll aim this to uh, Philip. Can the SIPC assist with creating a document for beneficial owner when an entity is being registered? This can be made mandatory. Clients are not happy to divulge of this information. So, Philip, um, Subsi, uh, can they can they create sort of a registry with beneficial ownership information and and make that available to 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 the to the accountable institutions of the Philip? Just again, uh, I I think at this stage there isn't a central registry with with all beneficial owners. Um, you know, and whether it's going to happen in the future, I don't want to speculate on that. Um, it would be a good solution, uh, or it would, it would be a solution. I'm not sure if it's if it's the best uh, solution, because of the fact that these uh, shareholders and beneficial owners change all the time. Um, you know, if you if you rely only on that uh, on a central sort of registry, then uh, you would have that challenge that it could be outdated. Um, whether it's going to to happen that it goes into that those details, I'm I'm not sure. Um, it is something that uh, we would have to discuss with uh, SUBC and with the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, and it's it's at the moment it's not in place. Um, what you can, if if you if you go to the SUBC uh, website and you put in a um, a registration number or a name, and it already gives you some information on um, So already you would find some information on the on the Subsea website, um, but it won't tell you at this point in time who the ultimate beneficial owners are. Um, yeah, when if that actually happens one day, then uh, I think we will convey that message to to everybody. I just want to add uh, something on on the earlier uh, issue relating to um, to the criminal you want to do business with. I think it's important that um, you know. Like everything in life, you need to have a balanced view also on this. So if there's, uh, if you pick up that one of your clients has been involved in something 10 years ago, look at what the, the, the transaction is. If that person wants to um, rent a, uh, a flat when he comes out of jail, um, you know, I, I don't think you must just walk away from each and every transaction. You must look at what the transaction is. What it, what are the risks? Are there risks for money laundering in this transaction? Um, and and then you decide whether you want to do business with this person or not. So look at the transaction. Look at where the money is coming from. Um, look at how how big is the transaction. What is the impact thereof? And then decide whether you want to to walk away from the transaction or not. Um, yeah, I think that's that's very important because uh, we also say in the FIC Act um, that you are allowed to continue with the business transaction even if you file a suspicious report. Doesn't mean that uh, you have to stop the transaction. So um, don't just walk away from each and every bread that may 
uh, you know, sound a bit not above board. Um, it's a decision that you need to take, but you also have to protect your reputation at the end of the day. Um, one other question that I don't know if got that is it acceptable to only fix shareholders with uh, 25 percent or more shareholding? Um, now they, again, there's not a clear cut answer. I don't want to say yes, you can only fix the 25 percent shareholder because if there are thousand shares shareholders and one person has got 10 percent and all the others have, you know, uh, less than five percent, then maybe you need to KYC uh, or, or do customer due diligence on that one with a 10% shareholding. So um, it, it'll it'll differ from each and every case, and therefore um, I don't want to, to say yes, 25% is okay or 25% is too high. Um, you will have to 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 use your discretion and manage that on a case by case basis to see. Um, you know, as as we explained in the presentation, first of all, you need to look at whether there's a controlling shareholding. Uh, by way of ownership of shares, and then secondly, is there control in another format? Um, and then thirdly, if you can't establish the beneficial owners by using those two steps in that order, only then you can go to the to the management of the company. Uh, but yeah, we we don't want to mention specific percentages. It, there are too many possible scenarios, um, you know, to to do this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, um, Philip. And then I think that brings us to the end of today's session. If your answer has not been, if your question has not been answered specifically, please do send it through to our compliance query portal. You'll find it on the FIC website. You can also contact us by um, uh, through the contact compliance contact center. The number is on your screen right now. So please do send us your queries. And uh, we do thank you so much for spending this time with us this morning to go through beneficial ownership. Um, we hope you have gained from the session. There will be further sessions in the future that touch on various other topics. So please do stay tuned. Uh, please keep an eye out for those sessions and attend where you can. Um, yes, from myself, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to Philip also. Um, and, and yes, please, or check out for the next sessions coming your way. We do thank you and uh, have a wonderful day further. Bye-bye.